It's preparing to live stream right now on YouTube. Okay. So let us know and then when you can start the meeting. Okay, are we good to go? Deanna? Says it's now streaming live. So, Deanna, I'm okay. assuming that's ready. Okay. Sorry, I said yes and I was on mute. Yes, we're all set. Go ahead, Doctor. I mean, go ahead, Wendy. Okay. Um, Deanna, can we have a roll call first um, so that we'll know who's present? Yes, I have from Madison County Health Department, I have Eric Feist, Katie Mungary, Erica Bird, Aaron Lazera, Roseanne Lewis, Samantha Field, and myself, Deanna Mapp, and Sean Prevo. And I have from the Board of Health, I have Alex Stepanski, Wendy Carey, Marla Velke Rieger, Dr. Edwards, Dr. Barr, Dr. Myers, Dr. Elder, and our medical director, Dr. Newton. Okay, good. Okay. So we'll call the meeting to order. We have a quorum. Um, and we'll start with our first item on the agenda, the high risk sports. Yeah, so if I may kind of just kind of, kind of go over this and kind of high level and break it down. First of all, thank everyone for uh, taking time to use uh, to meet in the middle of the month. We don't usually do that. Um, we will still be having our regular meeting at the end of the month as well. And I'll, and I'll go over a little bit of uh, what we'll do there as well. Uh, the purpose of this meeting was uh, to review three items. Um, the first one has to do with uh, high risk sports. Um, it's two weeks from when um, high risk sports were allowed to be played. Uh, so we, it's an opportunity to review we have some data for you. We have um, some resident feedback, as well as some um, to, uh, edits to the guidance document that was that the, the board approved. That uh, we made some comments through the email. So those are the three things for high risk sports. We also have a draft of wedding guidance. Um, as you recall, the governor put out um, announcement that the wedding events could happen starting the uh, 15th of March. So we've, we've drafted some guidance. We're not asking you to approve them tonight. We're asking you to review them, identify any additional information or uh, things that we need to consider for that guidance. And then we will go over those for approval at our meeting at the end of the month. And then the third thing was the request from the school superintendents. Um, Onondaga County had come up with revised guidance for quarantining uh, in the school setting. And the superintendents asked the Board of Health if they could review Onondaga County's quarantine guidance and offer feedback and, and comments on that. So those are the three items. The first particular item, I'm just kind of, is the high-risk sports. And just to recap, and, and we'll get into some things, um, the Board of Health approved the guidance for high-risk sports on January 28th. <clears throat> the Board of Health also sent an accompanying letter that expressed your concerns and risks associated with high-risk sports and a statement that sports should be delayed at least a month. Um, however, at the end of that letter, it also indicated that high-risk sports, if school districts choose to do so, could um, engage in high-risk sports. Uh, we did do a survey result, a survey of the schools to see which schools um, did and did not uh, decide to have high risk sports. And th that survey results was sent to you. We had 10 of the 13 school districts chose not to play uh, with three choosing to play sports. Um, the, we did receive um, also some feedback from community residents uh, regarding the school's decisions not to play. Um, which the schools have indicated were based on the, on the cover letter. Um, and that's kind of a summary of those emails. Uh, we received a total of 27 emails 
calls, if you will, of which three were calls, the rest 24 were emails. Three of the calls, two of them were from the same person. So at least those are the ones we fielded. I know some of the board members fielded some calls, but they're not included in this, my tallies here. Of the emails, 26 of them um, were requesting the Board of Health to allow sports to occur. And one was actually questioning why there was no spectators allowed in the sports. Of those, um, uh, the calls, like I said, two were from the same person and that individual was from Hamilton. Um, one call was from an individual from Casanova. Of the emails, we received 24 total, 22 separate individuals. Two people had sent two emails each for 24. 16 of the 24 emails came from the Hamilton School District uh, area. Five of those uh, were from the same family. Four of the 24 came from uh, Canastota and two of the four were from the same person. And then we had two emails that came in that um, I was not able to tell what school district they were from. But um, so that's kind of the summary of the, the residential feedback that we've gotten or received so far. Um, I can't speak to any of the schools of whether or not they got feedback, but from the health department, that is what we received. Um, and all of those were forwarded to you in your emails. Um, so the, um, at two weeks, uh, we decided to meet and to kind of look at how the data and the trends were going. So I've asked Erica Bird, who's the health statistician in my office, to provide you with an update. She provided a couple of things. She, she has a, the metrics she's gonna go over as well as um, just the COVID general data for the, for the county. So Erica, do you wanna go ahead and go over that please? All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. yes. All right, so I will start with just a brief overview of our COVID-19 num numbers. Um, as of tonight, we have 70 active cases. We are averaging about 10 per day of new cases. We are still at 86 deaths and we have 11 residents currently hospitalized due to COVID-19. In terms of the metrics that were set um, by uh, the guidance for high-risk sports, um, we are looking at that seven day rolling average for percent positivity. Um, across the board, Madison County, our central New York region and the state have seen significant decreases in that percent positivity. Looking at Madison County, uh, since January 28th, when the board um, sent out the guidance, we've seen a 44% decrease. We're currently at 1.5%. I also shared the regional hospital capacity as well as the hospital admissions. The percent of hospital beds available, um, again, this is a seven day rolling average, is 31% we have 30% availability in our ICU beds. Um, Central New York for our gross new hospitalizations per 100,000 population is 1.82, slightly below the statewide, which is 3.63. For the ICU beds, is that referring to the county or is that referring to the regional area since we don't have very many ICU beds in the county? Yep, that is the regional. So if you recall the metrics for, for the high risk sports was 5% for the percent positive and 25% for the hospital capacity. Anything else, Erica, on the metrics? I think those are the metrics. Thank also you. our vaccination rate as of a couple days ago um, provided to us by the state, we don't have this data, the state has to send it to us it was 11.7%. So it's probably a little higher than that now, but it's roughly 11.7% of the population. Did they break that down at all into how, how many are nursing home residents, how many are healthcare staff, how many are teachers? Do we, we don't have a sense of, of If that. they do, they don't share that with us. We just, we get that number from our regional state representative. Um, I do know that we have the second highest vaccination percentage in central New York. Uh, after Onondaga. Well, Onondaga has all these people getting vaccinated there. They have a lot more vaccination sites, but uh, I thought that was pretty good that we're the second highest in terms of vaccination. So um, we, we probably do 
Katie, we've done approximately what, 30, 3,200 vaccines uh, in Madison County through our department. I, I don't know how many of the hospitals have done or the, or the Kinney's drugs, but we do know that people go outside of Madison County to get vaccinated on. And apparently mm -hmm. those numbers are, are counting, contributing to our percentage, um, but the state's calculating that. So we don't know where those numbers are coming from. I'm sorry, I missed the number of the percentage for hospitalization in the region. The availability of hospital beds or the admissions? Both would be great. Uh, okay. So for the regional hospital capacity, we have, um, for the inpatient beds, we have 31% available on a regional level. And then we have 30% of the ICU beds available. For hospital admissions, we have uh, the gross new hospitalizations per 100,000. The rate is 1.82 for the region and the statewide is 3.63. Thanks. Thanks, Erica. Does anyone have any questions on those numbers? Um, if not, then another thing that uh, Dr. Myers had asked us to do, there was a, uh, an email from a resident that um, was referring to specific data from the state of Pennsylvania, some other counties. Um, I did have Erica uh, look at the, the information from those counties specifically, but also to look at other more similar counties to Madison County, both out of state and in state. And she put together a summary, which um, she has shared with you. So Erica, you, would you like to go over that report as well? Sure, let me just see if I can share my screen quickly. Um, I did look into uh, a couple counties in Pennsylvania that I felt um, between the population size and the proportion of rural residents um, mirrored Madison quite well. Um, on a whole, I think Pennsylvania has taken a little bit different approach um, to school learning and sports. Uh, they don't seem to have mandates as, men, as much as they have provided guidance at the Department of Health level um, and allowed school boards to make the decision that's best for their communities as long as they can adhere to the state guidance. So I did see that um, school in-person learning and sports, um, it does look like they've had throughout the school year. Um, otherwise, I didn't see a significant difference in the guidance between um, our DOH at the state versus Pennsylvania. One important thing to note, however, is that Pennsylvania does have a greater seven day percent positivity. There right now, seven day is at 8% uh, compared to our 3.7 at a state level. When I looked at a few counties, um, I chose Somerset, Clearfield, and Columbia. I randomly selected some school districts in those counties to see if they were participating in sports and pulled their athletic safety plan. I did note that um, according to the schedules of those districts, the fall season ran normally. Winter sports, including basketball and wrestling, had started um, competitions in mid-January. So they have uh, been in session for a few weeks now. And um, I just wanted to show this graph. Um, as you can see, the trend of the case rate, the seven-day case rate, is very similar to here in Madison County, although it looks like we're uh, doing a little bit better in terms of fewer numbers. Um, but again, it's hard to say if this, uh, the case rates are higher in these counties because of sports or other factors that we may not be aware of. So I did wanna just show that. And then I also did uh, a similar take on New York counties. Again, looking at those that are similar in population size and rural population um, comparatively to Madison. Um, so I pitched those four, Cataraugus, Cayuga, Warren, and Livingston counties. Um, almost all of which are running high-risk sports um, with the exception of one school district who opted not to. Um, but I, again, I wanted to point out that their sports uh, started some last week and the vast majority this this week. So I don't know that we will see different trends, 
or that we can make a, a judgment based on allowing high risk sports. Um, but as you can see, looking from January 28th to the 15th, um, we're following a similar trend, although we are again, slightly lower. One thing I will point out, Erica, if I may, is that with Pennsylvania, we were not able to get school specific data on cases like you do have in New York. Um, is that correct, Erica? Yeah, so that was definitely a limitation, I would agree. Thank you very much, Erica, for doing that. I had it, um, one of the letters that we had gotten that that individual called me to discuss it a little bit further. Um, and he very much wanted to make sure that we were able to look at some of that data. And I, I agree with you, it's too early to tell for a lot of things and it's too it's hard to tell whether sports played a significant role. Um, I know one of the things you sent also was Pennsylvania's guidance. And I will note, it was fairly similar to ours, which where it sounded like they didn't think it was necessarily a good idea, but they were leaving it open for permission. That's the way that I read it at least. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I would agree. I interpret it very similarly. Um, and their guidance, nothing stuck out to me that was vastly different from New York's guidance as well. Okay, so um, at this point, that's kind of the first item just kind of giving you an update on the data um, and information um, in response to various um, emails and, and requests. Um, is there any further discussion on this topic or a need to take any action at this point? Uh, question, Eric. Alex here. Yep. Um, you gave that list of schools that weren't going to start or participate in these high risk sports but most of the schools are now holding practices. Does that mean they've started? Or just not, they're not competing at this point, but they're practicing. I'm gonna ask Erica, what did you discover when you talked to check those schools? I know that was quite a while ago, but since then, since they took that report, I know they're, I know they're holding practice. Basketball I, I, and volleyball, at least locally here. Right. I don't know whether or not they've started the competitions. I mean, no, actually, Dr. Elder not. sent a link on you know Liverpool against Baldwinsville on, on, on TV. Um, but I'm not sure about those other school districts. I, I'm not aware of any competitions with Madison County schools, but but I, I'm not aware of any that aren't presently practicing. Right. Correct. Can I ask a clarifying question too? Um, it seems like there's a lot of liability buck passing um, that, I mean, the way you had described it to us initially is the, the state the state paved the road, we're setting up the guardrails, the schools are deciding whether to put the car on the road and the kids are deciding whether to, or the parents are deciding whether to put the kid in the car. Um, so I know we're, we, we've left it open for schools to start, but expressed concern. And because we expressed significant concern, many of the schools were uncomfortable starting. Um, Correct. We're also now, part of the state guidance was kids getting specific clearance from their physicians to play. Um, right. And so I've now in the last two days written 25 letters um, for kids. And, and I, I, I'm struggling a little bit with what I have to say in that letter because I'm on record as saying, I don't think it's a great idea, but we're leaving it open I'm so what I've generally been saying in those letters is that this student is not at higher risk than their peers. But I do struggle a little bit with I, have we given too much responsibility to the schools or not enough? Um, and then what is our role, those of us that are physicians on the board, um, when we've taken one stance but then are being asked to write a letter saying something slightly different? I don't know, Jerry, are you getting those letters as well? Yeah, we. Um... I, of course, mostly get them from CAS, uh, although I also have students in some nearby districts. And um, the way it was left in CAS was that if the interim um, reports are filled out online and the parent says there's been no change in health status, um, then they, because the physicals have been moved back, 
then it's left um, as an automatic okay because uh, you know just re it's just reviewing the interim changes from the previous physical. Um, so most most of the schools around us, uh, including those outside of Madison County, I've, I've specifically called the school nurses saying, "Can I be clear on what you're looking for here?" Uh, most of the school nurses says have said, "My board asked us to do this, but I don't necessarily think this is the right way to do it." Um, but they've all even, even there were two cases where I had I had done their school physical within the last month, but they still needed a separate letter. Um, so I, I think it's it sounds like it's open to interpretation. Right. I think there's a lot of interpretation. I think you're um, the way you're doing it is probably a good one because really all you're doing is saying that they're uh, okay to play sports. Um, and if they're asking for risk assessment of COVID, I think the way you put it is exactly right. If the kid doesn't have any uh, unusual um, uh, health problems than their average risk. If they have something like asthma, um, you know, I say that I s say pretty openly that that's, you know, that is one of the things that's uh, an increased risk, although it hasn't been shown to be a huge one, but it's just because there's a respiratory so, problem. So I, I'm treating it kind of like we do our perioperative risk assessments that we used to be asked to clear yeah. someone for surgery. And now rather than clearing someone for surgery, we're assessing the risks and what precautions we need to take. So I'm kind of treating it that way. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't mean to slow things down, but I just wanted to throw that wrinkle in there. Right. It's actually, I mean, so getting back, I know, um, I'm not sure if you wanted to take action on based on the data regards to, um, because this is an interesting position because as I mentioned in the beginning, you did approve guidance that did the, the schools could have high risk sports and if they choose to do so. Um, the schools have chosen not to do so based on your letter. So, um, and, 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 and they probably won't change their mind unless um, you, the board, make changes um, to the wording on your letter. And, and specifically in the letter, there's two sections that I think they are using um, as the basis for their decision. One, it says our board as a whole feels it's safest to delay opening of moderate and high risk sports for at least another month until rates for, can further decrease, more vaccinations can occur and we gain a better understanding of the new virus variants and their epidemiology. And then at the end of the letter, it also states, um, oh, I'm gonna find it now. Um, the board believes that it is safest if schools did not participate in high risk sports at this time. However, the schools choose to allow sports, they must follow the guidance. Um, so in the first part, that first component about the delay due to vaccinations and, and the rates, we provided you the information and data on the rates vaccination percentage. One thing I forgot to tell you, there was, uh, I sent you this chart um, this was from the state health department. It was from one of Governor Cuomo's press conferences. I was not able, to, I don't have a date on it, so I'm still trying to track down the date. I think it was about a week ago. One of the other uh, factors in our decision was uh, the variant strains. And what basically what this uh, slide shows is that there's at least one case of that strain through somewhere in the uh, across the state. So what Dr. Zucker said in his presentation is basically it's a, it's in the, it's across the state, but they only have you know they only have these identified cases, but they're in every they're all across the Western New York, Central New York. So um, getting back to the metrics, uh, I guess we can just assume that the variant is present. Um, the closest one that I'm aware of is uh, Onondaga County, although Tompkins also had a positive. Um, UK variant strain. So um, I don't know if we if we will have one, if the state will let us know. It's unclear how that information uh, will get to us. Um, but I just want to Can bring I, that to your attention as well. Hi, Eric. Yeah, this is Rachel again. I, I mean, I'm unclear as to who is 
deciding to do the extra testing also. I, I don't think we're really doing much testing to determine whether there's variants, well, unless you know. Not that I, I, that's not a, a call by the local health department. I don't know who's submitting for testing. Um, there are labs that they can submit to across the right, state. Right, but I don't think we're getting requests, so I don't know how they are finding out. I don't know. I, I, Dr. Edwards or Jen, did, do you know? Is anybody requesting I don't, that? I don't know, but I had the impression, and I can't tell you from where something I was reading, that there was sampling being done uh, by the state. And I don't know, I don't know how it's being done, but that I just had that impression. That's where I thought these numbers were coming from. And it sounds like there's some there's some specific labs in the state that are doing it, but none of them are immediately in our surrounding area. That there was one in Ithaca, um, one in Albany. Albany, right? Um, right. But not nothing immediately here. I know our our hospital samples go to New Jersey, so um, our ours are all co they come back yes or no. I don't we don't have any way as far as I'm aware to ask for any further testing. Right. I mean, once we're doing rapid, that's it. That's the specimen. So, um, and the few for pre-op, they go to Virginia, I think. So I, I just wonder how they're coming up with that. I did see in our literature that, that people think that they are not doing like other countries, checking to see if there's variants very often. I, I don't, I still don't, you know, understand how, who is doing it. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. And uh, I'll, I mean, but it was a factor that we had indicated. Um, and then the only data I have was that chart so far. Thanks, yeah. I'm just presenting what I have. Okay. And just to bring um, it back to our two big concerns were, were bringing the overall positive rate down and the presence of the variant. So in terms of the rates coming down, they're, they've come down almost 50% since we last spoke two weeks ago. Correct. Um, it's too right. soon to have any da data on whether other schools having sports open would have affected rates because it Correct. wouldn't have seen, even if we they had have. started two weeks ago, we still wouldn't have seen those. And there's really no way to know about the variants. So we've had one out of two of our, of our concerns that it seems to have been met and the needle moved in the right direction for those. So the question is, is it, is that enough for us to relax our stance and write a new letter? Or is that um, just half of what, half of it and we need to leave things where they are for now? I... Yep, that's, a, that's the question, thank you. Right, and, and the, the variants continue to be a concern. Um, they, they are here. I, I think everybody uh, uh, feels uh, comfortable with saying that's correct. Uh, to what extent is the problem? But nationally, they're talking about, um, I believe, uh, late March, it being the dominant variant in the population. There are, all, are also the concerns uh, um, that were sent around about some of the uh, data coming out that there that the uh, UK variant may be in fact more lethal, but there's also um, a, a question of whether um, they're more likely to infect kids, and it seems like they are. So you've got the improved positivity rate on the one hand, which is encouraging. Um, and I would say it would be encouraging to schools uh, if they want to go forward. Um, and I think we still have to stay vigilant about the, uh, the variants because this could change quickly. One, one question I have with the variants is whether or not we're going to see increase in rates of infection. It may be more infectious, but we are still seeing a decrease in the number of positive cases. So whether that affects that number or not, it's yet to be seen. And it, it seems to me that in terms of the variants, we're never going to know until after the fact because we do such right. a limited amount of testing. In terms of the rate that we have right now, 
it's hard to justify us saying that everybody should wait till the end of the month. I, I think it's safe to say that we still don't think it's a good idea, but if people want to do it, it's not necessarily, it's not needed for them to wait uh, until March. Yeah, I think, I think, go ahead, go ahead Jen, sorry. I, 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 I understand where you're coming from, but I think we were thinking a month, not because it was going to go down in two weeks, but to see what the rate goes. We still don't know what's going to happen next week or the week after. And we never will. Well, I mean, if it continues to go down, but if it all of a sudden the variants are effective and are in here and we do see it, then next week might be worse. So I think we made a month, not because we thought it was going to get better in two weeks. I mean, that's my idea that we, we wanted to wait to see. I, I think it was, I think it was unexpected that the rate would be so low at this point in time. Is that a fair I, statement? I think that was, that was a significant change. A happy significant change. Yeah. If, if you recall when on the 28th, the rate positivity rate was about 4.8, 4.9%. And we had set the limit of 5%. It's now at what, Erica, 1.5, you said? Yep. So it has dropped significantly. I mean, Jen, I agree with what you're saying about ping ponging, right? Like we've, you know, the governor made the statement, it's okay. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know, it's okay, but, right? And, you know, I think nobody wants to be the one with the face to say, go do high risk sports because we've given kids so much education about not engaging in high risk kinds of activities right now. Um, I received a number of calls, emails, text messages after our letter went out from families in our community, um, you know, very concerned about sports um, and, you know, that to be expected and, you know, making cases about mental health benefits um, in regard to, you know, to those kind of activities, which of course I'm, I'm sensitive to. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly impressed with the level of you know, where we are in terms of positivity rates, but I guess I'm just confused about what, or maybe I need some clarification. So what, what is it that, or are we suggesting, or, you know, what is on the table, the idea that we write a new letter and say, um, rates look good, so go ahead, but still be cautious. I mean, I don't think any of us, I don't know, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I need some clarification about, or, or you know, well, we need some, we need to decide whether we want to change what we've done. And if we want to change it, how do we want to change it? And um, what I'm, what I'm feeling differently about is the rate was so dramatically down. And we're meeting because I think in, in, in my mind, the reason we're meeting is because of that rate change. And I think I, I at least can say that I feel uh, reassured by that uh, with a cautious eye to now the next month, um, to, to mid-March to late March even, to see if rates go up. And if rates start to go up, then I think we're, you know, then I think I would be much more cautious. Well, in terms of the rates going up, we already have that in our letter. We've got the 5%, the 8% cutoffs. And we wrote that letter because we felt that those were numbers that we could stand by. Um, uh, it, it's such a disconnect. I have a friend in Australia that lives in um, Melbourne, and uh, they have three cases, and they shut down the entire city. Um, and and here we're, we're so excited that we only have less than 2% of the population coming out and testing positive. Um, it's, I, I still think we can stand by the 5% and the 8% numbers, but it's hard to stand by the delay until the end of the month or the end of whatever. Um, I'm still not in favor of having high risk sports, but uh, in, in terms of, of a stance that we can justify 
I think it's hard to justify us saying that they still have to wait till the end of the month where the rates are less than 2%. I, I agree with you, Sam. That that was well said. I I I I agree with that. I think we have to acknowledge the rates going down, and that's dramatic. And also, we are very cautious about the rates going back up, and that may in fact be a ping pong effect. But this whole damn thing has been a ping pong effect. I mean, this has been the wildest medical ride I've ever been on. And um, I think we're, I, I think, I think we're still cautious. I think we're still concerned about this, but uh, having said that we would watch the rates and they've gone down dramatically. I, I think the way Sam put it, that we don't have to wait now to say the rates are down um, and, and, we're still concerned. I guess that's the way I'd write. Uh, but I think, I think it might be worth just highlighting that because we've seen rates go up and down dramatically and we've seen particularly higher spikes after holidays or and such, that schools would be wise to pay attention to those moving data. And if even the trend starts to reverse, they might consider holding off an interscholastic competition without making it a hard stop, just being really clear that it this is, we're making this recommendation because we've seen a consistent drop over the last two weeks, but that hasn't been very much time. And if this is just a blip and we go back up again, then I think all of us would be back to where we were two weeks ago saying this is a bad idea. And we'll be able to comment on that in two weeks, right? When we have the next meeting. <laughs> Correct. So if I understand correctly from the consensus I'm getting from, from everyone is that um, everyone. Yeah, well that's yeah. what I'm trying to figure out who everyone who needs, but Rachel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rachel and Wendy and John have not commented on. I mean Rachel well, has I did. Go ahead. Rachel Reluctantly, uh, you know, I would agree with everyone because the rates are down. I'm just holding my breath. Uh, particularly, I think a lot of our schools are on school winter break this week. I don't know if they're traveling, but that could cause a spike too. Yeah, I, I think we've been fortunate to have the rates go down as far as they have, which I think is certainly very encouraging. And I agree. I think if we if we lighten up a little bit, the other thing is we know we're not going to be able to probably start it or stop the process until rates hit five percent. It's going to be hard for schools to, to all of a sudden shut it down, even if rates start to climb. It, it's going to be tough unless we hit those metrics that we talked about. But I agree, the rates have come down incredibly fast for what we were expecting. Well, I think I'm not so sure that they can't shut it down quickly. I mean you know, what's, what's happening in college sports, uh, for instance, SU was supposed to play Louisville tonight and uh, it got cut off because Louisville had another positive case. So I, I think, um, you know, if any team gets a positive, I, I think they're going to be pretty much done because the season is so short. Um, but are, they, are they going to see if they're asymptomatic? Are well, that's they, the thing. Most of the colleges are testing three times a week at a minimum. Mm -hmm. And we're not doing that with any of our athletes. No. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing that we could say is that we, we really encourage weekly testing, um, even though that is a burden for some. And that language is in the guidance. Yep. But they're not going to do the testing. It's too burdensome. Burdens. I, I, are there any districts that, that have the capacity to do that in our county? There are some that have asked about testing, but I don't know if they, they're, they're going to or not. I, I believe Kaz was talking about, um, they were talking about requiring it. I don't know what, what that, what came of that, but I don't think they, I don't think they did, but I think they're encouraging it, but that's just one school. I, I think I'm also concerned that uh, as much as we put these uh, guidance in place, just that 
my kids called me when they watched the basketball people with their masks down around their chins and not around their noses. I have a feeling that the guidance is guidance, but there's not any, if they're not doing what they say, there's nothing to stop them from following it. Appropriate masking. Um, I know that one, go ahead, Jerry. one of the things I saw, because again, I've seen Kaz's um, information, there was pretty strong language about uh, coaches need to be um, very, uh, the, the word's not strict, but the, they made it pretty clear that coaches need to enforce the mask rules. And they also said, they also uh, opened it up and, and gave a, a website to report people who weren't doing that. And that could be any kid coming home, telling their parents uh, what was going on in practice. Um, so um, I, I think that the way I, I just was impressed when I read it, that that would be a deterrent, I think. Because if there's one complaint, I, I think it's going to cause trouble. There's the 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 rest. The, the districts are so concerned about this. And I think in the fall, Hamilton was really on the fence about whether to let the kids play soccer or not, which was not deemed a high risk sport, and it was outdoors. I think the athletic director met with many of the other athletic directors in the area and just felt like schools were not taking the masking requirements seriously. I think after five more months of not playing, these kids are dying to play and will do almost anything to be able to play. Um, and I know at, at least at, at Hamilton, they ended up doing an intramural um, soccer league and they were extremely insistent. They basically said, you're off the field or you get a technical foul if you're not wearing a mask. Um, and the kids really gave each other peer pressure about it. Um, and I would hope that, that that's what happens. I, 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 it may or may not be applied equally across all the districts, but I, I feel like there's less resistance to mask wearing now than there was even just a few months ago in general. I agree. I did want to say to Rachel also, I heard from a couple of coaches in my community that specifically cited the coaching link, the training that we included. Um, and I think, Rachel, that had been your initial idea to kind of help support them. And two people specifically reached out to me as coaches to say that that was extremely beneficial and that helped um, them feel more, um, I think it was the Johns Hopkins training that we had linked. And module that, one. Yeah, module yeah. one. And that helped them feel much more um, comfortable going into it as uh, coaches. So... Uh, even though it, you know this is a process, like they've been working on getting that going through module one and doing the trainings, at least in, in my district and have felt that that was valuable. So thank you for that suggestion. Thanks, you. Thanks for sharing. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm trying to get some direction from the board if there's anything we need to do on this or not. We do have a couple other items to discuss. So um, I get the sense from the majority of the comments that you're willing to um, suggest at least that, um, that the high-risk sports can be allowed uh, given the rates decreased. Um, I guess my question would be, would you, would you say as of next Monday or you know, what is there a specific date you're setting? Um, if you set the first of March, then there's really no difference than what we've been talking about waiting till March for anything. So. I guess I would want to know a specific uh, language or stuff that you're recommending or not. So, so most of the schools are closed this week um, and most of them are not going to be able to go directly from opening to competing. They have to set up competitions with other schools. So I, I'd be comfortable saying Monday. Um, again, this is still we said they could start all along. We're just loosening up our language, right? 
Right. Well, yeah. I, but if you put it like Sam said, you know, we had said wait a month and now we could say, looking at the data, we feel like the two week time frame crafted, Jennifer, you do this better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think even if we open it up for this c coming Monday, in reality, competitions aren't going to happen until the following Monday. So I, 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 do we have to? Other than, you know, they might be able to squeeze a scrimmage in before something, mm -hmm. or, but leagues aren't going to get that organized or anything. They've and been practicing right along. And they have been practicing this week as well. They're practicing now, been practicing. Right. And many kids won't have the the required number of um, practices. Minimum number of practices in. Right. Or the letter from their doctor. <laughs> I mean, by, by allowing them Monday, you, you are giving them time to get all that stuff into place before they actually compete, which would probably be the following week. I think that's reasonable. Monday's fine. That's fine. Uh, Monday's good. Um, Rachel, how strongly do you disagree with us? I just think that we made a decision and that I don't think the numbers going down was in our in our thought process. I think that the variant and we were looking at a month of seeing what was going on. I mean, I, I don't agree, but I, I waved to the majority, but I definitely would not agree to it's yeah <laughs> so, so I, i'm still not setting I, my kid <laughs> I, i'm just deciding where were we setting our minimum bar I, i'm also I, I understand where you're all coming from i do but i i'm not sure if we're if we're looking fickle if we're i didn't i'm not sure we anything has changed other than the current rate is going down which that's great but we didn't say, oh, if the rate goes down to 1%, then you can start as soon as it's down to 1%. I think we said we wanted in school, we wanted vaccinations rates to go up and that, that I mean, they're going up. But I think right. all that do a 30 day, like, is anything happening? And not that once it started that you couldn't see the, you know, uh, increase too again. Right, but, Rachel, let me, let me correct you on one thing. You did say that if the rate was below 5%, they could play. Right. And it was hovering. That was in my thinking because it was hovering right around five. And I honestly, so I didn't was a key thing. Yeah. So, so I'm saying it was already under five when we put that out, though. Right. It, Just barely. And, and you issued guidance allowing the schools to play. Oh, right. They, cho okay. they chose not to based on your your the comments you made in a cover letter. Remember, so the got approved guidance. What you're saying is, though, that you've um, relaxed your, although that you still feel it's risk, and and, and, it, and it's the, the data the, the the data and the cases are moving in the positive direction, and that you feel that we can you know the schools if they choose to they can start to play next Monday. My my biggest objection initially was the prioritization of sports over returning kids to the classroom. That still is my biggest objection. But it seems yeah. like it's clear at this point that we have no jurisdiction over sending kids back to school and the governor doesn't have any plans to change that. So we kind of have to consider this as a completely separate issue, even though I wish kids would be prioritized over bars, restaurants, sports, everything else. It doesn't and seem like we all, to be. I think yeah. we all agree with that. But we you agree. Can't use, you can't use other than hybrid, other than hybrid models, we're not going to get everybody back in. It's impossible in most of the schools around here to physically space people out uh, to handle the day-to-day -day routine. It, they just can't do it. The schools aren't big enough, the rooms aren't big enough, and they're overpopulated. I read something from one of the people at Hamilton, I think it was school, that they just can't get everybody back in five days a week. It's, it right. can't happen with the other guidance and the wearing a mask and the distant, you know, sp spreading the kids out throughout the day. It just can't happen. Yeah. It's the six foot thing. If the six foot thing were relaxed a little bit, I think we That's can right. make a lot more progress. Right. But short of that changing. West, West Berlin just issued some new guidance. Actually. Yeah. It's a three West Berlin has no problem with uh, K, K through eight. 
because they took the seventh and eighth graders, moved them into high school a couple of years ago, overcrowded the high school. So they have two nice buildings with K through six. And they've been running uh, five days a week with their K through six program. Yep. But seven through 12 in the high school building, that just, that's, that's the hybrid model. And we've been working uh, every other day. So I, we're going in five days a week, but every other day, the cohorts switch. And they've been doing that in seven through 12. But I, I think, my, go ahead. No, finish Alex. Uh, out of my 12 calculus students, I have presently five of them that are in school. Two one day, three the next day, and the other ones are staying home all the time online. We can also reemphasize that and just say we're still hoping that schools can open um, yep. and, and encourage that in any way that can happen. Yeah, I think it's just just you know, you can't use schools not being open as a, to hold sports hostage. Right. So someone mentioned right. that. That was started, at, stated by the state, right? Yeah. yeah, we don't control the school. Although we did require, we did ask, if you recall, we did pose the question to the state. Um, the response was the decision for local sports is, the, for sports is a local decision, the school guidance is at the state level and it's not changing. So take that with what you can. <laughs> so let me play with some wording and I'll get with Dr. Myers and then we'll get something out. But it sounds like we're, we're going to um, kind of relax our position to allow schools to start with high risk sports uh, starting Monday. Um, but we can put some other language in there about, you know, Obviously, if rates, if things change, we will, we will then take action to um, cease and desist those activities if we need to. That sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The second, the second item with high risk sports has to do with guidance in the uh, revisions in the guidance itself. And Dr. Edwards brought this to our attention. There was a letter for school health examinations that spoke about permitting athletes to participate if they have pre previously had a health examination within like the last two years and no. have and provide a current health history completed and signed by their parent or guardian within 30 days of the start of the season. So there was some um, email exchanges be amongst you. And basically, if you look at page three on the, on the guidance at the top, it says each district obtains a medical clearance from the student athlete's healthcare provider. And then at the bottom of the footnotes that a physical is not required to be performed as part of the medical clearance, but can be done if indicated by the healthcare provider. From the exchanges and the emails from you, um, the, the, the change in the guidance that I saw, I'm trying to find my notes here. Um, okay, here, uh, basically, said that um, if they have COVID, if, they're, if they were COVID positive, they do need to have clearance from their medical provider. Otherwise, they, there is a form that is re referred to here, the Interval Health Advisory for History for Athletics. There's a form that has to be signed and the parent's attestation would be sufficient. Is that okay with the language change? I mean, I'll, I'll dress it up and send it to you, but basically that was the change was that they have to be cleared if they were COVID positive. Otherwise, it's the form and a parent attesting that they're okay. But it does sound like most of the schools have their own policy that's requiring a letter from their physician, at, at least four of the schools in the area. Okay. So I will, I'll take a stab at some of those edits, get that back out to you for your blessing, but does that sound all right? Okay with, the, with what we said there? Yes. Yes. Okay, that's what you told me. Okay, there was some, and then the last thing, there was some other suggested changes that uh, Dr. Elders had put forth. A couple were already in the document. I don't know if you saw them, so I just want to point those out. In your 29th, January 29th email, you talked about um, temperature should be taken prior to practice games and contest. Um, and then you wrote, should that also include more about COVID screening questions? Um, 
it doesn't it doesn't speak to COVID screening questions in here, but that is something we it doesn't really speak to temperature should be taken prior to practices and games, but we could add um, they should also screen for these questions. Um, so most most kids are being asked those questions on the days they're in school anyway, and we may just have to say that those questions should also be asked if they're on a remote day and have sports practice. I th I think that would cover that. Okay, so I can I can add some language to that section about question, you know, in addition, ask questions and screening questions that are typically asked the school. And I'll get that out to you. Um, the other suggestion that you had um, from Dr. Myers uh, talked about the reference to the capital region about the school being closed for in-person education. That language is, is the exact same in our, in our guidance. So there, there's, there's nothing that needs to be added. It's already in there. Um, and then, was there any other, any other suggestions? Rachel, I think that those were the kind of the key. Some of the others were edits to our cover letter, but I don't think we can go back and edit the cover letter now, but. Rachel, those were your recommendations. Are you okay with those? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I only remember about the the uh, COVID questions that we all get when that sounded like it would be good to add. You know, okay. lost. I'll, I will I will add those to you. Send you out the document and highlight those sections to make sure you're okay with the wording, and you guys can approve that for the phone. Okay. I just want to get your blessing for it now. Okay. The last, um, the next thing I should say, not the last thing, um, wedding. Um, what just kind of a quick overview on that, that uh, as I mentioned, the governor announced that starting on March 15th, New York will allow wedding receptions up to 150 people or 50% venue capacity, I guess, whichever is smaller. All guests must be tested, local health departments must approve. Okay, um, so we did put out a query to see whether or not the state was gonna be, the state currently does not have guidance around wedding events. Uh, we did ask if they were gonna push some out um, we did not get necessarily a clear answer as to whether or not they would or not, and if they did, when that would occur. I did query other counties through our state association. Uh, a lot of the counties were just waiting for the state to make a decision. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I like that idea because I don't know if the state will ever come out with anything. Uh, we did some research. We did find some wedding guidance from the state of Washington, from the Washington State Health Department. Um, Aaron's on the on the call here. I, I asked him to kind of go through that Washington State guidance um, and tweak it to 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 address some of the um, state guidance things for like food service and stuff that we already have in place here. Aaron, do you want to quickly? So we sent that out to you. I guess what I'm getting at is we sent that out to you. What we'd like you to do is look at it. Um, what other things need to be included in that guidance or taken out from that guidance? And if there's any other additional information that you need, um, and then we will, on the, the meeting at the end of this month, we will review and go over the guidance for approval. So um, Aaron, do you wanna quickly just go through what, what, what's contained in the, what they, you sent to them at this point? And so then uh, they have a general was, idea and then we can ask them to look at it, do some when homework, was, I guess. When was it sent? It was right. about a week ago, I think. I have to go back because I don't recall that. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking for the email. Maybe February 9th. It sounds about right. About It was about that time. We'll get it resent to you, Alex, just in case. No, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure if it was sent, I have it somewhere because I didn't get rid of anything. But. Yeah. Um, we'll send it, resend it just in case, so. Aaron, if you can just quickly give an overview of the guidance, what it hits on. It, it, it's pretty much a collection of other guidance like food service, um, music and schools, spacing. It, it contains all the normal elements. If you look through the state guidance, they have the, the, the main elements, contact tracings, uh, social distancing, um, face mask, things like that. So kind of look through those guidance that's already available and pick those elements out that would be uh, 
that you would see at a wedding. Um, the Washington State guidance, they, I didn't tackle the issue of dancing. Um, so the Washington State guidance says that there's only, the only dancing is the first dance. I guess it's the father-daughter dance. Um, I didn't put that in there. I didn't really know how to tackle it, but that's what they have. And looking at music and band playing, you looked at some of the school guidance with the 12 foot separation, um, kind of added that in there. So it's really looking at, looking at things that already exist for other, other aspects of COVID and putting it all together. And in, in essence, it is a, a business guidance document as well, because these are um, business venues that they're just happen to be around the weddings. I know we did get a question as to whether or not um, um, proms were going to be allowed if they allow for weddings, but that's, that's a different issue right now. So um, any, any, some, any initial thoughts or reactions on, on regards to the, uh, um, the wedding guidance? Um, if you hadn't had so, a chance to look at it, go ahead. So it, it, could I ask, if, so just weddings, um, is this any big event or is weddings separate? Other uh, hundred and... This, I'm looking at, it says wedding receptions. Governor that's Cuomo's our, statement was for wedding receptions, if I remember that's, correctly. That's, so yeah, that's limited that's to that only. The Washington state guidance rolled in funeral processions and, and uh, that, so. Yeah, but we just focused, so, it's just wedding receptions. So who is responsible? Is it the couple that's responsible or the venue that's responsible? for keeping the lists and making sure everybody gets tested. Do we have the responsible party listed? The, the guidance was drafted somewhat similar to what you saw for the schools. Um, it has plan administrator, plan coordinator. So that would probably be the facility. Um, they have guest lists that they have to give the facility. So I, I would, think that the facility owner um, would want to make sure that the, the criteria are met in order for their business to continue to operate. So then it puts some pressure on them to make sure that's in, in place. We are getting inquiries about whether or not a wedding receptions will be allowed. Um, they, they don't start till the 15th of, of March. So that's why we're having you review the guidance now. So on the end of the month, if we to approve them, they'll be in place for that to happen. The business is the one that would, if there were a problem, the business is the one that would suffer, correct? Correct. They would be the one that, you know, and and, it, and actually I did send you, just to give you an idea, um, there was a, there was a suspension of a liquor license at a wedding reception in New York as a result of non-compliance. So the, the state actually went after them, took their liquor license away. So um, this one has a little bit more teeth to it. Yeah, I mean, these are businesses. This is not, we're not talking about high-risk sports. These are about businesses that have not been able to operate. Um, so um, like I said, take a look at the guidance. If there's things in there that's missing or that you'd like to see, start sending us some emails so we can go out and get language for that. And then our intent is to provide, uh, present you with a final draft for the guidance for your review in a couple of weeks. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, there's nothing else on the weddings. The last thing is on quarantine in schools. And I know you had that conversation in the January meeting and, and decided not to change that. Um, since that time, uh, Onondaga County came out and changed their guidance uh, for quarantining in schools. And um, as a result, uh, the school district, uh, school superintendents, I met with them on um, last Thursday. Uh, they got a copy of that guidance and they asked if we, if I could present it to the board, which I sent it to you. 
for your review. Um, they wanted to know if this guidance was satisfactory or safe, I guess is what the term they used. Um, and if that's something um, we would consider, the board would consider. I also, um, since that came out actually today, we received um, contact tracing guidance CDC, um, updated their guidance. They removed the word proximate. That was the key, that proximate contact, the, the greater than six feet distance. That was the key thing that people, that hung, uh, hung the quarantine issue. When people got quarantined for proximate distance. So they removed the word proximate and only refer to close contacts. Uh, they do reference other factors that should be considered, but are now, are not specific on how those factors influence the decision to quarantine. This is factors to when considering when defining close contact include proximity, duration, longer exposure, time will likely increase exposure risk, and whether the exposure was from a person with symptoms versus one who was asymptomatic. Um, and then if they were coughing or not, masks as well around those infected persons by reducing transmission. So that we haven't had a chance to go through that CDC guidance, but if you look at the Onondaga's guidance, it, it, it kind of gets at some of those. They, um, uh, they pull out the guidance itself. Um, so they had, um, um, we had some important considerations that they wanted to make sure stayed in place, but then they basically said, a symptomatic case in the classroom, a mandatory quarantine for students two hours in a room, regardless of the size and seating arrangements. And I said, teachers and TAs, mandatory quarantine, the teacher after two hours in a room, regardless of the size. For asymptomatic in the classroom, no mandatory quarantine for teacher or students if the school administrator attests for the use of mask and strict adherence of seating of six feet or more and notifies everyone of the positive case and monitoring of symptoms for 10 days after exposure. Um, that's for K through 12 students if no seat assignments. Um, for K through 12 with known seat assignments, so the attestation is strict adherence to mask and physical distancing between students and the teacher. Um, for a symptomatic, only those adjacent to the case will be considered mandatory quarantine for 10 days the rest of the class should be notified with recommendation to monitor symptoms for 10 days. And for asymptomatic case, no mandatory quarantine will be required. Uh, notification to the class will be required. And then they talk about lunch. Um, so mandatory quarantine for students adjacent to the case, but not for the whole group. No mandatory quarantine for staff as they wear masks. In lunch period is less than an hour. For gym, typically wearing masks, 12 feet spacing in a gym class. No, so no mandatory requirement, regardless, no mandatory quarantine, regardless of length of gym class, unless they are doing contact sports, getting closer than six feet, and then review case by case. On buses for all ages, mandatory quarantine only if in adjacent seats in front, behind, directly across for over 15 minutes, shorter rides or individuals sitting farther away, no, no quarantine. Um, for staff that are COVID positive and staff to staff exposure, the general rule, mandatory quarantine for 10 minutes exposure within six feet with or without a mask, 15 minutes cumulative and 24 hour period closer than six feet regardless of mask usage or room size. School will continue to, to discuss with health investigating team and uh, that's, so those were the, their recommendation, recommended changes. I did reach out to Dr. Gupta to ask what was the basis for those changes. Uh, they felt that to, um, a relaxing of some of the guidance was warranted due to no transmission. They have not identified any school transmission. Um, I will point out to you in our last meeting that school transmission has occurred in Madison County. Um, and it looks like it is associated with a gym class uh, to some extent. Um, and a classroom. Uh, we are currently, we're actually visiting that school tomorrow to get the schematics and layouts of the rooms, looking at the air handling systems to understand airflow and direction. We'll be plotting uh, the, the cases, if you will, 
both negative and positive on a map and overlaying uh, airflow and some other factors to see um, if there is indeed a, a distance factor or an airflow factor. <laughs> and hopefully we'll have enough information to give some guidance uh, to you um, other than we have no school transmission, which is what Anandaga did. There are, we are seeing several counties starting to relax or not necessarily relax, but coming up with their own guidance for uh, specifically the proximate distance. Uh, either they come up with a scoring system or as Anadaga just came up with. <coughs> um, it is um, basically an, an absence of the state coming out with anything or any changes. So uh, the state's really being silent on this. But anyway, so the superintendents asked me to share that with you and to kind of get your thoughts and feedback on that. Well, these changes, um, would they have more <clears throat> impact for you, meaning us, meaning the county, to change its criteria, or does it put some emphasis on the individual schools to let you know what's different. For instance, some schools aren't able to um, distance, like Alex was saying. Some schools have better ventilation than other schools. So in, in, those, in, in those ways, I can see that one school could be different than another school. Um, but I don't know what kind of uh, burden that puts on uh, you and tracers and um, to, to, to make differences. It to some extent, it, it and, and Katie may want to chime in here on this. She might have more experience with this than I do. But to some extent, it's not going to change much of what we do. We do the case investigation, ask those same questions anyhow. Um, what you know, part of the challenge was that um, the proximate contact um, issue was was really an issue. There was no guidance from the state other than. Um, in the same room for over a period of time. And, and the period of time um, was not issued necessarily by the state, a blanket issue across the state. It was in an email from a state, our regional rep saying, saying, look at this. So it wasn't even consistently applied across the state. So, and now you have the CDC coming out and removing the proximate contact language. Um, I don't think it's gonna change our investigations or what we do, it may make it easier to say who's quarantined and who's not. It, it's still case by case basis. So we may feel like even after all that, if we see a, a teacher's aide who was going room to room who doesn't remember who they came in contact with, we can still make the call to quarantine everyone. Um, but this may give us a little, uh, it relaxes it a little bit to where we say we, we don't have to uh, quarantine everyone in the classroom. And, and the schools have been excellent. I can tell you our school districts have been excellent at doing the contact tracing and um, getting the information for us. They really do an, an excellent job. So I'm, I'm quite confident that we'll have information we need to make decisions. And they're coming to you because they want they want things relaxed a bit. Um, they didn't say that. They did say though that because three of our school districts are also in Onondaga's BOCES, so this is applying to their school districts and um, the school districts they deal with in their BOCES system. They wanted to know whether or not they, they want us to look at that and see if, um, if this, because again, they have some kids that live in Onondaga County that go to school there and vice versa. It's going to impact them and how they handle some of this stuff. Um, so they did want us to take a look at it. Like I said, the question that, the comment that was posed to me is to, they wanted the board to take a look at it to see if this was, they considered this a safe approach. And I'm not sure how you define safe, but that was the wording they asked. So, Katie, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? 
you're still listening. I think a lot of the issue the schools have is um, when you look at tracing for more than one day, um, a lot of times the proximate contact is what made, you know, quarantine go from just 10 kids to 50 kids. And I think that's, um, we, we really haven't seen the transmission from proximate contact. So, you know, I, and as far as um, what Dr. Edwards was saying, as far as how would that impact our contact tracing, a lot of that burden falls on the schools. So as long as the schools are willing to do that groundwork of keeping the seating charts and the scheduling and laying that groundwork ahead of time, I think that it's, it's a reasonable workload. Do you anticipate you'll find anything on the school visit that might change our guidance at all? I, I, if it's up in the air, I might be bigger, more yeah. ready to jump on board. It's such a small, it's like two teachers and three or four students. It's a small number. Um, we don't, like with the gym class, we don't, we'll have no idea where they were in relationship to each other in the room. Um, we're, we're going to try to understand what activity was being performed and how it was being performed. Um, in the classroom, we'll have a lot more uh, ability to say if the kids have assigned seats and they're sitting there, we can actually sit that down and we can actually measure distance from, but we're assuming that <clears throat> it occurred in those two areas that have occurred in the hallway. You know, there's a lot of still unknowns, but we're, we're going to try to look at that because we have the opportunity to. I mean, if Onondaga County says they haven't seen any school transmission, we may be the only ones in our region that have. And so this is the only data that's out there. So it's, it's all we have. We're going to try to take advantage of it. I don't know if it's going to show us anything. They have a lot much larger numbers in, in Onondaga County. So I feel like if they think that this is safe and have they just started using it? Have they just recommended it? Or is this something they've been I following? I think it was just issued either this okay. week or, yeah. I think whether the guidance has changed or not is based on rather thin science. So given that, if loosening it and changing things a little bit makes it more of a doable job, then it kind of makes sense to me. And part of getting kids back into school is not quarantining kids who don't need to be quarantined. That's right. so from that perspective, it makes sense. You're muted. I just had it said perfectly. Um, <laughs> the quarantine, the quarantine <laughs> issues tend to have more of an impact on, on, on the parents and their work and and so there's, there's more of an economic impact, if you will, with some of these quarantining things um, are, are much more so. And like we've seen up until that one incident in the one school district, all the positive cases associated with that positive occurred outside the school, but they impacted the school because teachers couldn't go to work, students couldn't go to class and people got put in quarantine. So, um, so I can understand, you know, and that's, that's very difficult for the schools to operate that way too. Um, and I know we've said that keeping kids in school is important, not only for their education, but also for, so parents can go to work while their kids are in school. And so um, this may have a, a, this may help us impact that to some extent. I think that's a really good way to look at it. Um, that if, if we have, even if we have in our county one or two transmissions in a year uh, that we've noted, that's a pretty low number and would push me towards uh, relaxing. And I believe uh, talking to Dr. Gupta, they, they put some um, additional monitoring in place from their perspective, you know, 
And I can tell you that the schools are very good. I mean, if we start to see cases, we'll know about it. We know about it before the schools contact us before we even get the lab result. So we're, we're knowing about positives even before we know about positives, if that makes sense. Um, and so they've been very good about that. Um, and, and, you know, this will be, and so I think we'll be able to, to track that really well. <coughs> yeah, I'm in favor. I think relaxing standards is a good idea or quarantine. If you would like, I can I can take a stab at drafting some that we can review at the next meeting. Yeah, that sounds good. Is everyone okay with that? All right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Very good. That is all I have for tonight's meeting, unless you had something else. Thought I'd go and let you out early. Eric, can I just clarify? <laughs> um, is our next meeting this coming Monday? I had it down for Monday the 28th, but maybe. Deanna, do you know what the yes. schedule is? That oh, is, is the monthly, um, yeah, the, our next meeting is actually the 22nd, huh? which, is, which is this coming Monday. <coughs> so you got a lot of work over the weekend to do. <laughs> but think how brief the meeting will be. <laughs> <laughs> <That's wishful. laughs> okay. Um, so... For tonight, just so in, I'm just to recap, um, I'll draft some language and, and, and work it with, with Jennifer with her wordsmithing mastery to, to get that something out regarding allowing schools to, uh, if they so desire to allow sports to start on Monday. The wedding guidance, if you would just review, it's, it's only like a couple of pages long. It's not very long. If you could take a glance through that to see if there's any other things or items in there that need to be added or tweaked please let us know. Um, if you could let us know, um, it's today's, you know, or by at least by Sunday, we can then have edits to you first thing Monday morning so we can discuss them Monday night. Um, and then um, I will draft some guidance uh, for the quarantine language in preparation of Monday night. And I'll try to get those out to you within the next day or two so you have time to review those beforehand too. Does that sound all right? Sounds good. Yeah, sounds, sounds good. good. Sure. Again, thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. For your guidance. Okay, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Dr. Endress. Okay, well, thank you everybody. And uh, sorry <coughs> I got tied up and got in the meeting, but I guess we'll see everybody or talk to everybody next Monday. All right. Okay. Do we need to motion? Good. Do we need a motion and, for yeah, adjourn to adjourn? Okay. Second. Box for the Bye. 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 Good night. All right. Good night.